I am very glad that we can um, think about this very important topic, as is our God. And my task, as you can see, is that uh, to show it from the Old Testament perspective, as we already started uh, this, this evening. And um, hopefully it will, it will work on this distance, so we can uh, see it uh, very clearly. Well, in order not to speak here till midnight, um, it will be good that uh, if you would like to have some details of what I am presenting, you can go to uh, two articles on the website of Adventist Theological Society. It's www.atsjats.org. And then you can go to the journal of Adventist Theological Society, to the archives, and you can click or write my name there, and then you will have these two articles, many others also, but these two articles about the Trinitarian thinking in the Old Testament, and then about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. So... I, um, because it is all written, I can uh, go only through some details, right? And this is good. So um, let's um, uh, um, see here that we as Seventh-day Adventists, we are based on, uh, our mission is based on Revelation 14, right? And do you know that in Revelation 14 is a Trinitarian thinking there very plainly stated? You have the fear God, Meaning the, you know, Heavenly Father. Then you have the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And we need to be faithful, believe in the Lamb, in Jesus Christ. And then you have also the Holy Spirit. You see, Trinity right there in the main focus, what we believe. Uh, so the Trinitarian God is a beautiful God. Is a transcendent, imminent but he's also holy, he's good, he's gracious, compassionate, and uh, I can continue and continue. And the most beautiful is that we can relate to this God. It can be our personal God. So we want to think about that, and what we know about God is only what he revealed to us. Do we agree with that? In Deuteronomy 29, Moses is writing, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us. So what we say about God is only what he revealed to us. And we should not go beyond that. And this is very important. And uh, um, Dr. Rodriguez already spoke about this uh, item. So... Um, you know, it is stated about uh, Augustine that he was once um, walking on the seashore and a small boy was praying at the seashore and um, he was doing something and so he was asking, what are you doing? And um, he was, um, you know, making a hole in the sand and uh, he responded, well, I am trying to pour all the ocean into my hole. Pouring the water from the ocean and saying, well, I am trying to pour all the ocean into my hole. Well, this is what uh, I am trying to do. Uh, Augustine was thinking to himself, putting an infinite God into my small brain. Um, you know, God is always beyond what we can understand. And people, people like to put an infinite God into the box of their thinking. But God, because he is an infinite God, uh, he is transcending and surpassing all our, even the best human categories. We need to know our limits. And we are using what kind of language about God? God is unlimited, right? He's eternal, and we are using a limited language. So uh, we need to uh, know that. And because um, he is God and we are only humans, and in order to understand him, we need to use human language. And it's very imperfect. And uh, this is why we need to be very, very humble 
and very relevant, uh, reverent when we are talking about God. We need to bow down before home, before him, before his revelation. And if we understand or not understand, still we can accept it by faith. And I think that experience of Moses is a model for us. Take off your shoes because the place you are standing is a holy place. So when we are talking about God, we need always to know we are limited. And God is a grandiose, majestic God. So we need to be careful, very careful what we say. Well, the basic uh, um, uh, confession of faith in the Old Testament is, Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, is one. Well, I see that the Hebrew language is, is through that computer not working, so it uh, doesn't matter. We will not use the Hebrew today. <laughs> Um, and um, we believe in one God, right? Yes. And this one God is manifested in three different persons. The um, uh, Father, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. Well, of course, when we say that, we have the um, mathematical problem, right? Right? Because if I will have here three pens, there are three pens. This is not one pen. Now, if I have three, there are three, not one. So mathematically, yes, one plus one plus one is three. Not one plus one plus one is, is, uh, is one. But uh, think about this. One times one times one equals One, right? So um, I don't want to say now mathematical formula about God. This is only, you know, a human, imperfect way to tell you that we need to somehow change our thinking because we are thinking too small. But if you think better, larger, you can, uh, you can see, oh, it makes sense. It makes sense at the end. You know, you can speak about one squared of the third power which is um, here also mathematically. But um, we will not speak about mathematics. Um, in the Bible, you have also the same word for one used for the marriage. Two are what? Are one. The same word as for God. They are echat, as God is also echat. So um, you can, um, you can um, see there are some imperfect analogies to a little bit know something about this grandiose, majestic, awesome God we are serving. Well, uh, let me tell you that when I was like 14, 15 years old, I um, met, um, you know, some preachers of Jehovah's Witnesses, and they were uh, telling me, well, let's talk about, about Bible. I said, of course, let's talk. And uh, they invited me and said, well, we will speak about Trinity. I was not aware of what is going on. I said, well, of course, we will talk about the Trinity. So I prepared biblical text, and I came for the first meeting. And after three hours of talking, I was going home like a beaten dog. I didn't know what I believe, really, at the end. <laughs> and I thought that uh, I know something about the Bible. And this was... Uh, you know, the uh, maybe beginning of my real good search of the Bible, what the Bible says about the Trinity, about the divinity of Christ, about uh, that the Holy Spirit is a person, and so forth. So something from all these studies of my life, <laughs> I am also sharing with you. And this was like the first beginning, which was a very good beginning, because they showed me how... I know nothing. <laughs> uh, you have plenty of biblical texts in the New Testament about Trinity. And uh, I am not here to speak about New Testament, but like uh, in Matthew 28, 19, you have the clear text that um, person who believe in, um, in God need to be baptized. Baptized in what? In three names? No, in one name. They will be baptized in the name. You will baptize them in the name, one name, of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
You see already here very clear indication and in biblical thinking. In apostolic uh, uh, um, you know, blessing in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, what uh, Paul is saying, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And there are many other texts uh, which I could use. You know, you know that statement from Acts chapter 5, when um, there is this, uh, you know, um, uh, story about how people are selling everything and giving uh, to the Lord, to the church, that people can grow uh, as, as a community of faith. And there was one, Ananias and Zaphira, with wife, and they said, well, we, we did everything for the Lord. And they lied, right? You know the story in Acts 5. And then you have that Peter said to um, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? And then later on he says, you have not lied to man but to God. Do you see that connection? Lying to the Holy Spirit is lying to God. It means that the Holy Spirit is God. It's very simple. In Zechariah 4, 6, you have the statement that not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit of God. My Spirit, says the Lord of God, will be accomplished, uh, you know, things. So what is Spirit? Spirit is not might and power, right? Not by might and power. So uh, Spirit is not might. It is not a power because it's a person who can bring the power and might. Very clear, very um, uh, um, you know, um, uh, transparent statement. So now I am making my life more miserable in front of you, more difficult. Does uh, Old Testament statements about uh, that God is one allow for the Trinity or is it excluded by definition? Uh, New Testament is repeating the, the same thought that God is one, right? In, in all these texts I, am, I have here. So I will limit my study to only the Old Testament. By the way, the Bible of Jesus and the apostles of the time. So I am not doing something different. So uh, uh, can we find some hints, you know, glimpses, allusions, traces footprints, or even explicit statements for the doctrine of the Trinity in the Old Testament. So this is our basic question now, okay? Can we find it or not? Because if it is not there, so how we can bring it to the New Testament? New Testament is not teaching something new. It's only application of all what was revealed before through the lenses of Jesus Christ, to the person of Jesus Christ. So this is very important. If we cannot find it in the Old Testament, oh, then we will be in big troubles. Because then um, we will say, oh, this is not there, but New Testament. But New Testament is um, not really new revelation. It's only uh, that continuation, what was revealed in the Old Testament, and now made it plain, in Christ Jesus. So, let's see. Uh, now, sorry for, for that Hebrew. I thought that my computer will work here, but for some technical reasons, uh, uh, these good uh, people could not find a way how to work it. Uh, this is the word um, Elohim here. And some people are saying, well, you know, the first glimpse for the Trinity is the use of that Hebrew term Elohim. In, in the Hebrew Bible, you have several the words for name of uh, speaking about God, like Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai, El Shaddai, and so forth. And they say, Elohim? You know, it is a plural. So it's a plural ending. So it must be, uh, this is this im here at the end. This is a plural ending. So it must be God, like many persons. Well, is it really a good um, indicator for the Trinity? Maybe those who believe so, I will now bring a disappointment because this term Elohim 
it's really not a good term by which you can prove that uh, we have the Trinitarian thinking. A very simple uh, proof for it, you have like in uh, Ruth chapter 1, this term Elohim can be used for the living God, but unfortunately can be also used for the pagan gods. When, um, you know, Bible authors want to describe this pagan god, they were also using, they are gods, Elohim. Um, but there is a difference when, you know, the living God is there, the verb is in singular. And by that you can know that it is really the living God, one, um, one God. And then, um, you know, it's different with this uh, um, pagan gods. So um, now let me read here. Look, uh, said Noami, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her Elohim, her gods. God, uh, go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your Elohim will be my Elohim. Hey, you see, uh, this is uh, very powerful. So in other words, the term Elohim is a neutral expression. It is not per se evidence for the Trinity. Okay? And I, will, uh, and I already told you, for example, text which was uh, explained and by, my, um, by uh, Dr. Rodriguez, it's Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God... Elohim, plural, and then you have created. Is it in plural? No, it is in singular. God, Elohim, created, singular. And then you have ten times stated in the first creation story, and God said, Elohim, plural form, but singular verb said. Okay, this is how it is in the, in the biblical revelation. Much better indicator for the, you know, reminiscence of the original knowledge about the Trinity is the term, Hebrew term Adonai. Because this term Adonai is literally uh, plural with I, with my. Literalistically, if I translate, it's like my lords. And this uh, is a much better indicator than, than Elohim. All right, so now uh, uh, the... Second thing, what about five divine plural expression of us, or of divine us? We have four passages with five statements of God when he speaks about himself as in the formula of we. We God, not only I. Majority of statements in the Bible is I, I, divine I, I God. But there are five uh, statements when God speaks about himself in the terms of we. Let me go through this four text. Uh, Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our image. You, you know that. In uh, Genesis 3, 22, uh, yes, humanity was like one of us, God is saying. Then um, in Genesis 11, 7, when they, you know, people are building the Tower of Babel, God is saying and saying, let us go down. And then once again is used, let us confuse. Okay. And then for the fourth time or fifth time, but in the fourth passage is in, from Isaiah 6, 8, when God is asking after Isaiah saw this beautiful glorious, awesome God, and um, this majesty God is now coming to him and asking, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? You see, I and us, it's the same. And uh, then um, Isaiah is saying, well, here I am, send me. So um, uh, how now to um, understand this um, five uh, statements about um, plural of God, when God is speaking about himself, we. Well, first of all, some people are overlooking it, <laughs> uh, like it does not exist. Well, this is biblical revelation, we have it. Um, uh, there are some, like Targum of Isaiah, 
uh, they um, you know, eliminated the formula of we, but this is never a good, good thing to change the word of God, right? Uh, so we need to interpret. So uh, how to interpret? Let me tell you that there are seven very good possibilities. Well, not always so good, because I will show you that actually six of them are really not very good. So I will go very quickly for the details you go. You can go to the, um, you know, my article if you wish. Uh, but the first one is that some uh, scholars are saying, well, this we formula for God, this is reminiscent um, of the mythological stories. And this is like mythological stories, gods were creating something. So in the Bible, we have also that. We don't believe that, right? This is very clear. I don't need to explain. Um, in the Bible, we don't have mythology about gods. Uh, second possibility is that, uh, uh, you know, some people are saying, well, here, God the Father speak to his son and saying, let us create man to his image. And as you can see, this is found in uh, some very ancient literature, uh, Christian literature. And the first um, council of Sirmium in 351 after Christ not only affirmed that Genesis 1.26 was addressed by the father to the son as a distinct person, but also excommunicated those who deny it. You see, it was like very strong, very strong. Well, is it, is it good? Well, uh, if you say it's, uh, so, uh, that's fine, but on what basis you will say that? Um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, predecessor was speaking about Genesis 1, 1 and 2. And who is in Genesis 1? Heavenly Father, right? Uh, the God, Creator, Elohim. And Genesis 2 is the Holy Spirit. So why it is, um, must be like, uh, father is speaking to the, uh, to the son. Maybe he was speaking to the Holy Spirit, right? Or maybe he was speaking together. Um, son and uh, Holy Spirit together with the Heavenly Father. So, um, well, this is maybe a good direction, but uh, not the answer to, to, the, to the issue. The third possibility is, some scholars are saying, that here God is speaking to earth and to elements of earth, and um, now um, saying, well, we now together, we will create. Well, <laughs> this is not good, right? <laughs> earth is not a creator. Uh, so why would the earth be a partner to God in creation? Yes. Then, um, this is very popular. Uh, many think that this uh, divine us, divine we, is a, a plural of majesty that God is now speaking like the medieval kings, uh, when uh, king of England or king of uh, Russia or France were saying, we king of Russia, you know, or um, uh, we queen of England, we are not amused. You know, this is that language of we, plural of majesty. Uh, it's, it's nice if, you would, um, if the Bible would um, be written in the medieval time, I would say this is a very good explanation. But the Bible was not written in the medieval time, right? It was then written in the time of Jesus and before Jesus. So, for example, you have kings in Israel. Do you have any formula about David or Solomon who would say, we king of Israel? No one statement like that. Um, you know, there is no evidence that any king of Israel or Judah or any other ancient ruler in Babylon or in Assyria or in Egypt would use the formula of uh, majesty. Yeah. So this is also ruled out uh, from the Bible, biblical text, uh, and even um, from the uh, you know, Near Eastern uh, literature. Another possibility is, and this is very popular in the modern literature um, of um, you know, exegetes of the Bible, they speak that God is now here in that uh, you know, divine plural addressing heavenly court. He is speaking to angels. 
And now he speaks, yes, let's, let us create together uh, the uh, man to our image. Well, um, so they speak about the plural of government, government of Yahweh. Well, it is true that there is a heavenly court, right, in heaven. And there, is, there are also uh, angels there. But uh, you cannot think that this heavenly court is an, actually the power which creates. This is different. You know, if I go to the biblical text, I can give you two very strong arguments that this is not a biblical thinking. Why? Because as you can see in the Bible, we as humans, we were created to the image of God, right? And uh, so God created man to what image? His image. Not the image of angels and himself, not the image of the heavenly court, only and solely and uniquely only to his own image. So this is the first very important exegetical uh, reason. We were created uh, uniquely to the image of God and not to the image of God and his angels. And then, how many creators we know from the Bible? Only one, right? This is a theological reason. God is the only creator. And um, so, you know, it is not possible that we'll be like angels, co-creators with God. Only God is the creator. Well, then uh, there is another possibility. You see, <laughs> uh, six as, uh, scholars were coming. Uh, some scholars were coming with a statement. Well, probably this, um, you know, statement, let us make man to our image. God is uh, speaking to himself and is encouraging himself. You know, when you have a, um, a difficult task before you, you, you have a challenge. So you sometimes speak to yourself, right? Oh, let me do it. Yes, I can do it. Why not? And, and we will do it. Does God need to speak to himself to encourage himself in order to create? <laughs> so uh, this is also uh, probably not the best interpretation. So our God is not a solitary being who speaks aloud to himself in order to exhort himself for his uh, creative activity. So here we have uh, then, um, the um, uh, last possibility, uh, and this is uh, what scholars are calling plural of fullness. This is a you know, very complicated word, right? <laughs> Nobody knows what is it. <laughs> it's a plural of fullness. <laughs> so, um, you know, they are speaking about um, intra- a divine deliberation, and it's so complicated. It's actually a very good interpretation, but very complicated. So let, let me bring it a little bit home and expand on it. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, who is right? From all these uh, seven, I think that the last one is pointing to the right direction. But we need to make it better uh, to understand it. So um, only... The biblical text can give us the answer, right? So how is it with the biblical text? You know it uh, very well, so let me, let me tell you. According to the biblical text, God is presenting himself as we in these five uh, statements. Even in majority is I. So yes, God speaks in the formula of we. And when he is speaking in formula of we, when he is coming to create Humanity and how he is creating humanity as uh, one person. Now he is uh, creating male and female, right? And he wants that these two will be one. So when he, as a creator, is now creating humanity, and this is in plural, he speaks about himself also as plural as we, because we are created to. His image. So do you see the connection? So, uh, yes, uh, God's we creates humans as we. And um, I would like now to explain it a little bit more. I would like to speak about the plural of fellowship. Plural of community within the Godhead. So this is this 
plural. This we. What is that we? It's a society by itself. It's a community. It's a fellowship, uh, which is there. And this is confirmed by these other three passages. When um, humanity, as we, rebelled against God, what God comes, he's coming also as we. And says, uh, this uh, humanity, they were like one of us, but now they are losing, losing that what uh, they had. In Genesis 11:7, when humanity, you, you can see how it is beautifully structured. It's, um, you know, written uh, what we call like going to the mountain. You know, you can put it in this way. And at the center, you have the divine judgment. But before, you have the speech of people. And then you have um, a divine speech. And what people are saying in the rebellion, we, let us reach heaven. And let's, let us make our name great, and so forth. And when people are rebelling and saying, we, God is going down and saying also, we, let us go down. Let us confuse their language. And uh, the same you have also in Isaiah, or similar thing in Isaiah 6, 8, when you have this parallelism very clear, this I and us, it's really God himself who is commissioning Isaiah to go, uh, to go and preach the right message. So um, in um, uh, this uh, conclusion of that thinking about uh, this uh, plurality of, of God, we can very clearly say that this is really plurality of fellowship, community, we of God. God is communicating within himself uh, about issues. And the um, uh, us expression does not contradict, but allows for Trinitarian thinking in the Old Testament, even though it does not proclaim the Trinity plainly, at least yet. Okay? But this is a very good indicator. Oh, there is more, much more in the um, uh, Bible about God than only like uh, mathematical formula one. Okay? This one is more. It's we. All right, now... Let me also tell you that this oneness of God is more, not that one, but united. You know, it's not like stress on oneness or on mathematical oneness, but in the oneness in the sense of unity, not on numbers. And I can go into it, but very quickly, this one, that God is one, means that God is unique. Nobody in the whole universe is like him. He is the other. Amen? Uh, secondly, he is also exclusive. Only he can be praised because he is unique. Um, um, so he's a sovereign God. And thirdly, he is also one in the sense of unity. This is this plural of fellowship. It's a unity. God is a union rather than aloneness, okay? It's a basic of, uh, of society. God is really one. It's a diversity there. And um, uh, we have, I will not go in, into that. Um, and already um, uh, Dr. Rodriguez spoke about that God is love. And if God is love, it means he's an unselfish person. And how you can be unselfish unless... You are this fellowship, this um, plurality of, uh, of fellowship. And in this, uh, you have that they express this love for, him, um, uh, for each other, and then together for you and for me. Yes, this is very powerful, very beautiful. Now, um, in a um, uh, now, um, summary of, of things, um, I would like to expand um, uh, on things. What hints we have about this plurality of God in the Old Testament. So first, we saw that um, you have this, um, that God is speaking about himself in the formula of we. Four verses, five times saying about himself we. So this is the first good indicator that we have Trinitarian thinking. Second, you have texts like in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 9, that someone is coming from the heavenly Father, sovereign God, 
And this someone who is coming from the heavenly Father, the one who is coming, is also God. Wow, in the Old Testament, God is sending God. <laughs> and there are two different persons. Uh, for example, here is uh, speaking about Emmanuel. You know, the, the sign will come, God with us, right? And now this um, God with us will be whom? It will be a child. And uh, this uh, child who is sent from God to us as a child, who is that the child? He is a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You, you, you see that uh, in the Old Testament already you have this, uh, I think now here, explicit statement that um, this uh, um, another person coming from God, he is really God. You cannot miss that. Okay? It's not Moskala saying, it's the biblical text who is saying that. All right, now the, the third thing, we have plenty of passages in the Bible, and I have no time to go through it, when the, um, these passages are about the angel of the Lord. And, um, uh, you know, um, this is a you know, study for um, the whole day <laughs> by itself. But let me tell you very quickly that this angel of the Lord here is a very clearly divine person. You, you can see that in many other situations, like for example, in Exodus 3, you have um, that Moses see um, the burning bush. And who is in the burning bush? The angel of the Lord. And then, after a few verses later, you discover that this angel of the Lord is God who is speaking. So, and you have several very powerful texts like in Judges and Genesis and so forth when this angel of the Lord is really the Lord. And you can also discover that they are like, in some situations, like two different persons. All right. Then the fourth, we have biblical texts in the Old Testament which distinguishes between two divine persons and to my shock, and beautiful shock, beautiful surprise, I discovered that there are even texts which speak about three divine persons. And I would like to share very quickly, because our time is uh, uh, rapidly going, some of, of this text. So first, let's go to the set of biblical texts which will speak about two different divine persons. Okay, two. Okay, so now um, uh, already we saw um, uh, Dr. Rodriguez was speaking about Genesis 1, 1 and 2. You have the Creator and the Spirit of God. Very clear. Two different, uh, you know, entities as creators. Uh, and by the way, this, um, you know, statement that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, you ask that question, uh, what he was doing there. Well, actually, the text is telling us he was hovering over the waters. And the word hovering in Hebrew is merachefet, and this word merachefet is used for the, for example, uh, mother eagle or for eagles of parents, or even um, in other texts uh, for um, the, um, you know, the hand or so. But here you have a picture uh, about a parent eagle, and what the eagle is doing is uh, in the text, um, in biblical text, another one is speaking that the um, uh, eagle is hovering over the little ones. It's taking care of the little ones. So this picture is showing that the Holy Spirit was there from the very beginning for what? For taking care of the newborn planet baby. <laughs> Uh, or uh, newborn planet, who is like a baby, right? Is hovering, is protecting, because uh, this is uh, creator, as it was explained before. And in Genesis 1924, it's a, a gen, um, judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, but it's a very interesting detail in the text. And the Lord from heaven um, rained down burn, burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. You know that the Lord, 
Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate Jesus, was with Abraham, down, right? And now you have this detail. Yes, um, uh, the Lord uh, sent this, but from where? Not from here, from earth, from this pre-incarnate Jesus. It was coming from uh, the Lord out of heavens. Very interesting detail, you know, there. It's about speaking about um, my angel. I spoke, uh, spoke already about angel who can be a divine person, and you have I, I will wipe them out. Uh, um, uh, let, let, me, let me only go to some text because our time is uh, uh, advancing rapidly. Here is a good text. Psalm 110. You know that this is a direct messianic psalm. When David, when he's composing, is directly speaking about uh, Jesus Christ, who is his Lord. And what is the meaning? The Lord, Heavenly Father, says to my Lord, my David's Lord, okay? And who is this David's Lord? So the Lord is speaking to my Lord, David says. So there are two Lords now here, right? One Lord speaking to another Lord. And this Lord is uh, David's Lord. This is Heavenly Father who speaks to Jesus Christ. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. This is one of the very clear, explicit statements already in the Old Testament. That there are two Lords. But these two Lords is one. <laughs> okay. Um, now, in Proverbs 8.22, we will hopefully speak about that tomorrow. In Proverbs 30, verse 4, look at this text. Um, who has ascended into heaven and so forth, and now is speaking about creation, and then the last sentence. What is his name of that creator, you know, who established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name? If you know, wow, it's coming like of, out of the blue. You, you are puzzled. Creator is here, and it's not uh, only one. It's um, he and also his son. Uh, very powerful text. In Daniel chapter 7, one of the best chapters in the Bible about the heavenly judgment. And who is in the heavenly judgment presented? The Ancient of Days. But he is not alone. Who is with the ancient of the days? The son of man. And who is the son of man? You think that son of man refers to man, right? Wrong. This text is actually saying that the son of man is a divine person. It's up, first of all, it's in heaven, okay? And how you can know that it is a divine person? Look what this text is saying. In the vision of the night... I looked, and I, there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. This is the indicator for you. Why? Pay attention. This person is something unique because he's riding on what? Not on horses, not on mules. He's not going, um, you know, on feet. He is riding on the clouds. Who is riding on the clouds in the Bible? Only one uh, person and, uh, or one, um, you know, entity, and this is God himself. And I can give you plenty of texts which shows that God is riding on the clouds. It's, it's beautiful. So two very clear, distinct, divine persons, okay? Hosea 1.7, yet I... I it's a divine eye. I will show love to the house of Judah, and I will save them, not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but by the Lord their God. Wow. Heavenly Father is speaking, yes, they will be saved. By, by whom? By the Lord their God, speaking about our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Zechariah 3, 2, the Lord said to Satan, Yahweh, in the Hebrew text, Yahweh said to Satan, Yahweh, let Yahweh rebuke you, Satan. 
Wow. Yahweh speaking, let Yahweh rebuke you. And you can see that you have, again, this um, one God with two different persons uh, here. Then Zechariah 10, uh, 12, I will strengthen them in the Lord, and in his name they will walk, declares the Lord. This is a messianic uh, statement. Um, another, um, uh, the last one I have here is Malachi 3, 1. And I, it's uh, Heavenly Father, will send my messenger who will prepare the way, or here is this, this I is uh, Jesus Christ, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Who is that who will prepare the way before Christ? The John the Baptist. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. Who is that Lord? Jesus Christ. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come. And who is saying that? The Lord Almighty. You see? Again, two different divine person already revealed in the scriptures in the Bible. Now, let me go very quickly to four passages which speaks about the three different divine persons. And this was for me like big revelation when I studied that in the, in the Bible. And of course, uh, it is, uh, all these per, uh, passages are in relationship to the servant of the Lord, Eved Yahweh, the suffering servant. And uh, let me go very quickly through um, uh, this uh, four texts. Um, Heavenly Father now speaking and saying, here is my servant. Who is that servant? Jesus Christ, yes, the suffering servant, whom I, Father, uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit um, on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. You see, you have uh, uh, the, uh, the I, uh, Father, Servant, Jesus Christ, and then it is the Spirit of the Lord which is uh, here. Um, you see, as um, um, the, you know, Jesus Christ belonged to whom? To the Father, so the Spirit also belonged to the Father. As the servant is a different person, so the spirit is a different person. It's very logical. It's, it's, it's very, very, um, you know, uh, revealed very clearly. Here you have another statement. Come near to me and listen to this. From the first announcement, I have not spoken in secret. At the time it happens, I am there. And now the sovereign Lord, Heavenly Father, has sent me, the servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ, with his spirit. All three in one verse. And another text is Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. This is the text Jesus Christ was using when he started his public ministry in Nazareth. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. So the spirit is the Holy Spirit, right? Of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord... The Heavenly Father has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and so forth. Very plain. Three persons in one text. And here, this is one of the very strong texts, Isaiah 63, 8 to 11. He, the sovereign Lord, is speaking, surely they are my people. You know, Israel, they are my people. Sons who will not be false to me. And so he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. You see, angel of the Lord. He is now the Savior here. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them and so forth. Yet they rebelled and they grieved whom? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So you have here... All three divine persons. And its Holy Spirit is a person because they are rebelling against the Holy Spirit. They are grieving the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is very plain. So in my final conclusion, the Old Testament teaching does not contradict the biblical monotheism or the Trinitarian thinking. 
There is no contradiction. It's a continuity. It's a big, one unified picture. We have discovered beautiful Old Testament hints to the Trinitarian thinking. It demonstrates a consistent picture of the Holy Bible in the relationship between Old and New Testament. And now listen. What is latent? It means what is hidden like a treasure in the Old Testament is what? Is clearly revealed, made plain, where? In the New Testament. Yes, what we have in the Old Testament, hidden, but stated, is more explained uh, in the New Testament. Why? Because one of that person who is um, the Old Testament speaking came in flesh. And now you can understand better. Because he came to reveal God, who is God. And now, the New Testament is not presenting something which is uh, entirely new or foreign to the Old Testament scriptures, to the Hebrew thinking. And this is a very important conclusion. You know, there is no contradiction between Old and New Testament. It's a continuation here. We have nothing new in the New Testament which is not already revealed in the Old Testament. And I hope that uh, this uh, presentation this evening help you to glimpse at least something of this beauty and majesty, majesty of God. Yes, let's ask God for a wonder, for a glimpse to see him and then to admire, worship, and serve him. Amen? Amen. God is beyond our understanding. Instead of trying to explain details of his Godhead, we should do something better, yes? yes? Instead of trying to explain details of his Godhead, let us relate to him personally, because he is our personal God, who is one, he is unique, he is united, he is unity, he is plurality of fellowship at the same time. And the fellowship with him enables us to understand the beauty of the plan of salvation and build also a true community. Because he is a community, he's a fellowship, we can build also a true fellowship with each other. Amen? This is very, very practical. In him, we have everything. He's Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. This is why Jesus Christ said very plainly, know that this is the eternal life. And what is the eternal life? That you may know the only true God. And this is the Heavenly Father, right? He speaks about Heavenly Father. But not only him, but also me, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So this is that existential and experiential knowledge. Not only intellectual but uh, what we know, it's only a little bit. But our experience can be big. And bigger our experience with God, better we can understand and know something about our wonderful, awesome, beautiful God. God bless you and happy Sabbath.